Hi, what's up YouTube? In this video, I'll be giving you an in-depth introduction to the Interplanetary File System or IPFS for short. For now, this is going to be a, a three-part series where in this video, I'll explain the theory behind IPFS. In the second part, we'll actually use the CLI or command line interface to explore different IPFS commands and interact with the network. And in the third video, we'll create a small Node.js app that uh, utilizes IPFS and their uh, node packages. So if you'd rather skip ahead to the, the practical part of the tutorial, you can go uh, to part two. But I find it important to have a good idea of what is happening under the hood. Okay, let's start by installing IPFS on our system. Um, to do that, you can go to their website, which is ipfs.io. Then we'll click install, and we'll install from a, uh, we'll be installing from a pre-built pre package, which is of course the recommended way. Uh, recently, they released uh, version 0.4.19, I believe. So, uh, once you've gotten to this page, you can click here, and here we'll f uh, you'll find all the, the binaries for your operating system. Now, um, yeah, you, you can follow the rest of the instructions to install it. And to test it out, you can just type IPFS, and if this returns a list of um, commands, it's been installed on your system. So yeah, now let's get started. So to use IPFS, we'll have to initialize a node in an IPFS repository. To do this, uh, you'll have to type oh, you'll have to type IPFS in it, uh, and this will generate um, a peer identity with a key pair for you, which you can inspect with IPFS ID. I can show you that. All right, so your ID is basically just um, the multi-hash of your public key, and your public key is unique, so. Uh, the, the multi-hash will be unique as well. Now, oh, by the way, I'll, I'll talk about multi-hashes later and why they also st uh, they always start with QM, but for now, let's just focus on the basics. So yeah, um, IPFS init also created an empty repository in your home. Uh, not an empty repository, but it created an, an uh, IPFS repository in your home directory, which uh, contains all the necessary information for your um, IPFS node. Right, uh, once you've initialized your um, IPFS node, you should have gotten a command that looks like this. Uh, you can enter that in the command line and it'll, it'll return something <coughs> that looks uh, probably exactly like this. So if you're famili familiar with Unix-like terminal commands, you'll know that cat means to display the content of a file to the terminal window, which is exactly what we're doing right now. Uh, the hash that you see here, so the one that starts with QM again, um, is actually a directory in which the readme file can be found. So the, the file structure is pretty intuitive. Uh, to see the other files in the directory, we can use IPFS ls and we'll have to copy this hash. Right. <clears throat> and here you can see all of the other files in the, in the directory. You can take a look at the quick start file for a list of commands you can try, but I'm gonna um, Firstly, explain how IPFS works. Juan Bennett, the founder of IPFS, originally wanted to build a system that was good at distributing and moving around uh, version scientific data. So versioning is basically, if you know Git, you know versioning, but versioning gives you the ability to track changes in software and of course, just files. Uh, I'm not gonna talk about versioning software here, but if you're interested, I'll put a link in the description. IPFS has been evolving though, and now its catchphrase has become the distributed permanent web. I found uh, Juan, Juan's explanation a very good one, so I'm just gonna use that one. So IPFS is a distributed file system that seeks to connect all computing devices with the same system of files. In some ways, this is similar to the original aims of the web, but IPFS is actually more similar to a single BitTorrent swarm ex exchanging Git objects. IPFS could become a new major subsystem of the internet. If built right, it could complement or even replace HTTP. It could complement or replace even more. It sounds crazy, it is crazy. Let's start by looking at some of the um, benefits IPFS has over HTTP. We'll take the example of going to google.com in your browser. So when you type in google.com and hit enter, simplified, this is what happens. Your computer sends a DNS request to a domain name server, which will be the one of your internet service provider probably, and asks which IP address belongs to the domain google.com. Uh, we can do this ourselves with the host command, so let's try that. So host google.com. And this uh, gives us back an IP address. Now, 
the DNS um, server will do the same. So it, it sends back uh, the right IP, which is basically just the location of the Google server serving the web page. You then um, set up a TCP connection with that server. And when that is set up, you can send an HTTP GET request. So the server now sends the request page back to you and uh, your browser renders uh, the page. This whole process is called location-based addressing. Um, since the identifier of a certain piece of information like a web page or cat picture is based on its location. So <clears throat> the IP address. So let's copy this address and demonstrate that uh, by typing it in, in the browser. So we'll do this and bam, yeah, we got redirected to google.com. Now domains are basically just for human re readability. So we don't have to remember all the uh, server locations, but that's basically it. Now, the client server architecture on the web has been useful for a long time, but it's time for an upgrade. HTTP has many weaknesses in the areas of uh, security, privacy, and efficiency. Some of the most common ones are that you have to go all the way to a specific location to access some data, even though someone probably has requested that data and has it locally closer to you. And of course, HTTP links break all the time. You might have seen uh, these error 404, 404s, I'm sorry, um, causing a lot of our data to be deleted daily. And then the big companies like Google, Facebook, and Amazon control almost all of the data of its customers, only making them dominate even more. Uh, a peer-to-peer -peer architecture allows uh, for you to download stuff from multiple peers at a time instead of just one server at a time, resulting in a lot <clears throat> more efficiency. So every node on a peer-to-peer -peer network is a server as well as a client. So whenever a client joins, um, the amount of servers on the network increases linearly. Now back to IPFS. IPFS does things a little differently. So instead of location-based addressing, it uses content-based addressing. This means that the identifier for a piece of information is directly linked to the content of that piece itself. IPVS achieves this through uh, cryptographic hash functions. And if you see my video on building a blockchain in JavaScript, you'll know that these hash functions are a way to build a unique fingerprint of what you put through them. In a blockchain's case, that would be the block's content. And in uh, IPVS case, that would be the contents of a file or a page or anything that you can put on IPVS. There are also one way, so it is or should be impossible to derive the inputs from a hash. Let's uh, go through the process of adding a picture to IPVS. This process happens all under the hood, of course, uh, but let's just visualize it. So first, the picture is converted to raw bits that the computer can understand. Everything there is to know about this picture is encoded in those bits. After that, the raw image data gets passed into the SHA-256 hash function to get a, uni a unique digest. Then to address the content, IPFS creates a content identifier or CID. This is what we uh, search for on IPFS when we're trying to get the image. The content identifier is of a format called multi-hash, which is a self-describing hash format in base 16 or hexadecimals. With this I mean that the type of the hash function can be derived from the first couple of characters in the hash. So first we have the, the hash function code, um, which is for SHA-25612 in hexadecimals, of course. Uh, then comes the digest length in bytes, which is uh, 32 bytes in the case of SHA-256, but uh, we'll have to convert that to hexadecimal, so that will be 20. And then finally comes the actual digest. After that, the hash is base 58 encoded, which is why all of the CIDs start with QM. The reason for using multi-hash is so that the, the CIDs or content identifiers become future-proof. If, for example, it turns out that uh, SHA-256 isn't secure anymore, the hash can be upgraded to a better function that identifies itself. Since IPFS is a, is a large system though, we need to find a way to slowly, but in the same time as fast as possible, upgrade to a different hash algorithm, all the while keeping the existing system intact. Now, the second problem is that a lot of the APIs these systems rely on assume a certain type of hash and its length. If Git would, for example, switch to SHA-2, it's now using SHA-1, uh, an incredible amount of applications would just break. This is why it's important to use hashes that identify themselves. So this process is called uh, content-based addressing, as you can see there. 
here's an example of what uh, SHA-1 would look like in multi-hash format. So you first have the uh, function code, which is 11 in, in um, hexadecimals. And then of course the length, which is 20. And that's in base 10, that is uh, 32 for 32 bytes. And then we get the hash digest. So all this, the fact that an input gives us a unique hash means that all content on IPFS is self-certifying since the identifier is literally a checksum of the content itself. This is why IPFS is also called a self-certifying file system. So let's see this in action. I've opened up a terminal and I've made a test directory that we're gonna add to IPFS. I'll uh, show you the structure of this. So let's do that with three. So you can see there's a, a, a dir directory inside of this and then two files. Um, we'll use the command IPFS add with the flag R to uh, add the, the directory recursively. So all the directories and the files in the directories as well. So we get back a bunch of hashes and the root hash is the bottom one. To visualize the data, we we'll use uh, a tool called GraphMD. And this is already auto-completed, so I'm just gonna do that. All right, I'm gonna show you what this looks like. So, what you can see here is um, our, our um, directory on IPFS, but then in, in a visual way. So, every rectangle and hash you, you, can, you see is an IPFS object, with the root hash being the test directory. I'm uh, gonna go to my slides and explain that in a better way. All right, so the, the root hash is the directory. Um, an IPFS object consists of data and links. Since this object is, that, is a directory, the links it contains are links to the objects in the directory. Uh, let's look at the test directory uh, with IPFS object git. So um, IPFS object git, and I'm gonna copy the hash. So this one, IPFS object git, and I'm gonna pipe that into a command called jq, which is just um, a JSON visualizer for your uh, JSON markup for your terminal. So as you can see, uh, there's three links and then some random uh, binary data. So the links point to the files inside of a test and to a directory, as you can see on the slides. Um, data in IPFS forms a Merkle DAC, which is a data structure that's a combination of a Merkle tree and a directed acyclic graph or DAG. The Merkle trees ensure that data blocks exchange on um, these peer-to-peer -peer networks are correct, which is done by organizing the files in the tree structure using uh, the hash functions we've been talking about. So if we look at that, this we look at this, this is the Merkle DAC, as you can see, with uh, these hashes. Let's visualize what a Merkle tree looks like. So if one of those hashes is incorrect, all of the above hashes would fail as well. So if this reminds you of a blockchain, you would be right, because a blockchain is basically just like one big Merkle tree. Um, a DAG is a way to model a sequence of information that has no cycles. This sounds very complicated, but uh, the most basic example would be a family tree, just to make that a little clearer. Uh, this is by no means an extensive explanation, but I hope you get the gist. So we can now think of a Merkle DAG as a data searcher where hashes are used to identify objects in a DAG. All data on top of a Merkle DAG is now tamper-proof since we can, from the top down, track where exactly the hashes didn't match. These searchers also allow for another great feature, which is data deduplication. If we take a look at the Merkle DAG of our directory again, you'll notice that ipfs.txt in the dir directory points to the same hash as the ipfs.dup.txt uh, file. This is because their contents are exactly the same, so there's no need to add them twice, you can just point to the same object. So this saves a ton of storage space, evidently. Um, Let's just look at uh, those, the bo both those files. So I look at IPFS dupe in the test directory. Come on. Slash IPFS dupe.txt and then this slash tier slash IPFS .txt. All right. Uh, the last thing I want to mention about data on IPFS becomes clear if we take a closer look at um, nature.jpg at the picture. Um, you'll notice that this isn't just one object, it's actually of the same structure as our directory. It just references other objects. This is because IPFS objects are of the maximum size of about 
262 kilobytes, so our picture was chunked into smaller objects, which form another Merkle deck for which a, a base uh, content identifier is computed. So let's explore this property in the command line. If we do IPFS, I'm just first have to retrieve the hash of our picture. So this one. All right. If you do IPFS, if IPFS object get of the picture, I'm gonna pipe it into JQ again. Um, we can see which hashes the root object links to. If we IPFS get one of those. Um, one of those links into, let's say, a separate picture, nature1.jpg, for example, and we try to look at that file, you'll see that it's basically literally just a chunk of, uh, of our picture. Now, the IPFS cat command, if we do it on the picture, on the, on the whole picture, it concatenates uh, those different chunks together, and we get the whole picture. Nature full. nature full, as you can see. All right. Now the reason for this is pretty simple. So, when we're requesting a large file from the, net, the from the network, our peer can actually request the different parts of the file from different peers, and it will put it back together in the end. So this is basically eliminating the danger of one peer going offline and thereby taking the whole file with it. It also enhances decentralization and, and download speed since we're not relying on a single node or server to download the whole file from. Now the last two technologies I'd, li I'd like to talk about so you can have a pretty solid understanding of IPFS are distributed hash tables used for finding peers that serve specific content and BitSwap, which is the protocol <coughs> uh, that defines the rules by which peers on the network exchange data and it's inspired by BitTorrent. So a hash table is like a Python dict or a JavaScript object, meaning that if you have the key, you can retrieve the value. With IPFS, the key is the content identifier of some data, and the value is the peer identity of someone who has that content. So imagine you would like to search for this, ha this hash, you would query the hash table, and it would return you a node ID you could connect to. Um, with a distributed hash table, the data is distributed over multiple nodes. This means that it isn't such a big deal when a bunch of nodes suddenly leave the network, because the routing would be handled by the other peers. So when requesting a file, your node qu queries the DHT and finds peers to connect to. The mechanics of how the DHT is queried in the fastest way possible and all that are outside of the scope of this video, but if you want to know more, I'll put um, <coughs> a, link of the, a link in the description of the Kademlia DHT, which is the one that IPFS uses. Once we found a node that has the content we want, we need a way to get that content. The exchange of data blocks in IPFS is inspired by BitTorrent, which is a very interesting peer-to-peer -peer exchange protocol, of which I've put a great introductory paper in the description. But BitTorrent and uh, the IPFS implementation of the protocol have a couple of key differences. So the IPFS version of the protocol is called BitSwap, and the main things that it has in common with BitTorrent are a tit-for-tat strategy, meaning that if you don't share anything, you won't receive anything e either, and downloading the rarest piece of information first. So this means that when a peer selects uh, the next piece of a big file to download that's been chunked into smaller objects like we've seen, it selects the piece of it selects the piece of information the fewest peers have. Now the reason for this is of course increased efficiency since it's faster to download a piece of, of data from a lot of peers at the time at the same time instead of just a few. Uh, now the main difference with BitTorrent is that well with BitTorrent when a couple of people are looking for a specific file, say the same movie, they form a swarm and only trade blocks within that swarm. With BitSwap, blocks are traded cross file, which is why IPFS basically looks like a giant BitTorrent swarm. The way BitSwap is set up is that it incentivizes data replication to go against files going offline. This is implemented with the BitSwap strategy and Filecoin, which I might do a separate video on. Filecoin is a, a cryptocurrency, so it's basically an economic incentive layer for uh, the data replication. It's not um, a publicly traded coin yet, but it has done an ICO. Now it's all pretty game theory-ish, which I don't know enough about to mention in depth, but for the purpose of this video, you now know enough about IPFS to start doing some very interesting stuff. So in the next video, we'll start by doing some um, commands in the command line to explore the network even further 
and gain a deeper understanding of everything. So that we can use IPFS in an application we're gonna build in part three with uh, Node.js and the NPM uh, packages that IPFS provides us. Now, thanks for watching and uh, yeah, stay tuned.